eight would be for them because they're the one. There's eight of them, so it's it represents them, the new order or new world order. Regeneration, it's them getting ready. Resurrection, not for us, not for Jesus. Resurrection for them, for whatever they're going to do because it's them that's playing. Here I am, number eight. There's eight of us, okay? Not our resurrection going to heaven. There's or whatever the black awakening is, this is it. Okay, why did they chop off your hair? I'm very curious about these uh, smaller things. I mean, I know they're big things, but there's so much to Satanism. It was the hair chopping for self-esteem, loss of self-esteem purposes. That was part of it, but the biggie, again, that's part of symbolism, and they did it because Samson in the Bible had power because of his hair. They chopped it off, right? This is what it meant to them, and that was the most of what it meant to them, you know. And, of course, we looked awful. We looked like we were uncared for, and we were obvious to people. The other kids in school with us that saw us with our hair chopped up, and it would be gappy, and the torn clothes, and, and, and fox holes in them, and stuff like that. They recognized us pretty fast, but they had parents pumping their heads full of mess, too, saying, you see that one? Now, make sure you hit that one as hard as you can tomorrow. Stuff like that. See, now, these kids grow up like that. They have precision in, like, a, like an animalistic precision, in case people never seen it, and I've been around wildlife so they may not, but an animal that will stare at you, and it, it waits for the right second to to go to make the move and go, right? And it wants to catch the, the, the prey and the predator here we're talking about. You know, they want to catch the next meal when they can catch it off guard or when it is the weakest. And this is how they did with us. And their kids, they literally would stare until we look away or we smile or we start talking and they think they got us off guard and then smash our brains out with a heavy book, you know, or whatever they were told to do, trip us, and, you know, stuff like that. So it seems they sit in a way forever because I've read that a professional stalker or somebody who's done this their whole life sometimes will stalk a victim for 10 years before they actually strike. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, well, for the Satanist and for the typical stalker out there that's by himself, it's still a sexual bread effect and, uh, because it's still psychopath. What about the holes in your socks? I'm curious because I've had socks. I get up, I go to the work, I go to work every day, and when I get on the train, I go downtown or the bus. I put my socks on, I was getting holes all in my socks. They always had holes in them. They were cutting holes in the socks. And a lot of other victims get holes in their socks and their clothes as well. What is the purpose of the holes? Um, they don't want us to look nice and neat and, and good, you know, well, the little children, that is. They want them obvious that they are unkept and neglected and no one actually cares about them. So that's part of it. In my school pictures I have, and I'm going to be posting them one of these days, but when I do, you'll notice when I'm talking about my hair, my bangs being uneven and stuff like that, and it's going to be really obvious that, you know, someone did that on purpose. Just like Maury, when we... It was well, it to get you... Uh, in a, a, a sort of way you're rejected by other children because you're not as neat as they are? Yeah. Do they want to make you... That's part of it. They want you isolated. Right, they, they partly do, yeah. But we were easy to spot for them right away at the playground, look for the kids with the raggedy clothes and the chopped off hair, so each of us kids, they could spot us easy and they could point us out to their children easy. Because of this being a generation thing, if this started up a hundred years ago, whenever that group died off, then it died off forever. But by having their children involved and their grandchildren involved, and by them keeping our children and our grand grandchildren as victims, then they keep it going. And we literally are hostages and prisoners. You know, I always felt like a prisoner in my own home, and I was because of... Uh, the way they stayed on is 24 hours a day. And even when I was a little girl and I was walking to school and I'd see these people and they actually would try to run over me or holler, come here and get in the car and stuff like that, you know, I would think, gee, all these grown people wasting all this time, you know. Why do they waste time keeping track of a child? But I was I called the experiment, so I was one of their guinea pigs, 
So that explains part of that. And they literally watch us for a lifetime. They pick out their victims before they uh, actually kidnap them, you know. I'm wondering if the tearing of the clothing and the unkeptness helps signal other Satanists. So if I walk down the street when I'm unkempt and my clothes look like they were hit by a Satanist because they have holes in them and I look terrible and my hair is chopped up because at my weight they did take a hunk of my hair out. I wonder if I walk down the street if there's other Satanists who recognize what they've done. Yes, so you become a target for more than just the group that's after you. If you're walking down the street and you have certain clothes that are torn or faded, if it's a sign to other Satanists who are out in the street, it's like right. you're a walking target. I'm, I'm wondering if that's, that's the reason. Because they're doing this to adults, too. It's not just kids. Obviously, I'm an adult, and the uh, victims that I deal with are adults. And they said the same thing. Their clothes are horrible. They said they feel so messy when they walk outside. And I'm just wondering if that's a signal to others. Yes, it actually is. Yeah, they they know they know the little signs and they know what to look for and, and stuff like that. Well, can I ask you, when you were a child, at three years old, you were forced though to have sex with people that you did not want to as a child. Um, I, I was actually I was raped. Yeah, from the time I was four years old, I was raped from then on. I mean, violent rapes. Um. I was never put with somebody and told, now go have sex, except uh, for a, a couple of famous people, uh, Eric and Carlos, that is, not other famous people, just them two. But they they put people together that kind of way, but they didn't be nice to me, you know what I mean? They didn't say, now you're going to go up here and have sex with this friend of mine. But yeah, you were forced. You were always forced. Um, because no four-year-old would know what that is anyway, so obviously you're forced. Yeah, Every child, right. and Satanism forces, I was trying to say sex to be nice, I, I should say rape, it really is rape, right. and child molestation. So they forced you to do this starting at four years old. Yep, I was raped when I was four years old. And that just kept on all through up to your teenage years until, until you Until I was 17 and a half years old, yeah. And how did you cope with that as a child? As you got older, seven, eight, nine years old, you realized what was happening. A well, four-year-old, I'm, I'm sure, as a four-year-old, you were bewildered. I can't even imagine what you could have thought at four years old. But as you got older, you probably grew up very, very quickly. And I can't imagine what you must have thought. How did you cope with this at seven, eight, nine, and ten years old? Um, you know, I always had God on my side, and I always knew that these people were wrong, that they wasn't going to win. So I always had God, and I had, I, I kept myself interested in what I liked, you know, nature and uh, gardening and, and, you know, just whatever I liked. And I'm reading, I, I still like to read, and uh, stuff like that. And it, it gave my mind some ease from the continuing stress, because we can't live with this every second of our life, and they tried to force us to, but we had to have breaks from it, and it was like taking a break to read a good book, you know. So, yeah, but when I first met Eric and Carlos, they both wanted to know, how do you do this? How do you put up with these people and survive these people? And I said, whatever the atmosphere feels like, whatever's going on in the room, if I should... If these guys are laughing, I don't want to cuss them out and say, I don't want to be here with you. I'm going out the door and get beat up. Uh, just just keep your mouth shut or go along with whatever they're saying. You know, if, if something's wrong with them, say, well, I hate to hear that. Try to deal with them a little bit human, you know. And uh, it was important to uh, not just fight them and smart mouth them all the time. Of course, once in a while we got fed up and we had to strike back, you know. But uh, most of the time we had to just put up with them because... When we struck back, we knew we were risking our life or the life of someone we cared about because of the generation deal and because of us being hostages. We were literally hostages to these people. As a child, you have no means to escape. Were they making money off of you when you were forced uh, and raped? Were you sold to people? Uh, or was this just like a ritualistic thing with the Satanists? Yeah, it was more ritualistic for me. Um, 
I don't know if they made any money off me when I was unconscious and they brought people in and wrote me or not. Now, they might have. I don't know. 